Hello and good evening everybody to this event that is part of Wildfest 2017. I'm Madeline, one of the co-directors. We're in the 12th day of our 26th festival and it has been going amazingly brilliant so far, if we do say so ourselves. Um, the theme this year is revolution. There's our logo. If you love it, you can take it home if you want a bag for a small charge. Um, and we've been looking at all sorts of revolutions. Tonight we're going to be considering revolutions in music. And we've got a stunning array of guests to do that with us. After the break, we have the inimitable Posey Fanny Tutti who will be joining us to talk about her later on her new book. We've also got on the decks Lord Balfrey, who is a revolution in his own self, a revolution in his own lifetime. Um, and, but first, we have Punk Survivors, um, a concept created by our guest curator and host, who I'll introduce you to shortly. You might guess that he works for one of our radio stations. <laughs> Punk survivors, what does it mean? It's already caused some debate before the evening has even started. Is it somebody who remembers when 69A was 81A? Is it somebody who remembers when Pro Records was on Button Street? Or somebody who converted their own flared jeans into draperies? only to have them split down the other thigh as soon as you try to go out in them, or someone who has a kettle for a handbag. Well, you know, that's enough of my teenage reminiscences. <laughs> I am now going to invite you, uh, introduce you to our host, who will introduce our expert panel for the first half of the evening. And our host, of course, is Roger Hill of BBC Radio Merseyside. Roger is our Liverpool's punk survivor. He came here in 1978 when punk was at its most first exciting phase. And he went on to um, have a radio programme on BBC Radio Merseyside, which is now the longest running alternative music programme in the country. Uh, Roger does a lot of things. He's a storyteller, he works in education, um, he writes. But tonight he's going to be focusing on music and some of the people who make things happen. Could you give a big welcome to the stage, please, to Roger Hill? Thank you. Um, but before that, I'm just going to say, uh, now and a little later on in the evening, I'm going to mention a little bit about this, um, this program, which has lasted 40 years. And it's almost impossible to imagine that programs could have lasted that 40 years as alternative music. I mean, folk programs, yes. Big band programs, yes. But alternative music was such a volatile thing that there was a chance that it would, it would be so unpredictable that it, its future would never be able to, we wouldn't be able to pin a program on it for 40 years. And we did. And we're really proud that we kept it going. I'm um, playing my little party, making sure that it, it keeps staying around. And it is a program that can be heard all over the world, not just in Merseyside. Uh, and it does get listened to all around the world as well. And I'll be telling you about a couple of other events that relate to our birthday, which is actually technically June the 10th. I'll be telling you about that. Uh, just before we do the second part of the evening, as you know, we've split the evening into two halves. This will be a panel, and then later on, at 8.30, because the Tutti will be joining me on stage uh, in a one-to-one, -one in which there will be a uh, subject of the book, which is over there, if you're interested in inspecting it in the interview. And she will be doing some book signings after that. Uh, and the important thing is that I've never done a Q&A in my life where I haven't involved the audience. In other words, we will break from the conversation I have with the panel for you to throw your questions at them, and then I will finish it up. So, uh, have your questions ready, there's some things that you might want to, to ask them. 
So, um, just one thing about Port Survivors. Um, it was obviously 2017 was 40 years of, I mean, we discussed this before, probably not. Um, some people debate when it started, but it seems a good place to start 77. Um, but it wasn't immediately about surviving from that. I took a look around the world now, 2017, and I thought, you've got to be really resilient to survive this. This trumpery, this maybe, that is what we are being bombarded with at the moment. And so I thought, well, what has punk got to say about survival? That doesn't mean that people who come up on stage now will be punk survivors. They may not wish to have themselves called that. And maybe I don't even wish to be called that. But something about a strong, muscular revolution that changed something about the culture um, must have something to say to 2017, particularly as we've been pitched into a highly political period. So that was the reason why it's point to survive. It's not that we were looking around for people with sort of zero frames and bus passes and saying, did you do that? Right, cool. None of that. It was, it was not about the individuals, it was about the idea. So our panel, who I was hoping would be there, and I hope they will be very soon, I think they're about to treat this way, are uh, threesome. Um, in no particular order, we have Don Lex, who's actually going to be DJing in Liverpool around the corner um, very soon after this. Don, of course, who is the um, person who effectively recorded or um, documented so much of the public revolution and then went on to do more with theatre, sorry, with television, screen, and the rest. I mean, Pick it up! All right, you see, there he is. There's the display. Don Lex! This world, this, isn't it? Point of so, if you didn't see this penetration and you didn't see the invisible girls, we hopefully saw her last year at Mac, I think it was last year, um, and she's going to be coming back several times. She's, her music career has now been kind of um, brought up hold, and there's a lot of things to be said about what happened in between. And then finally, Steve England, who's found his way there. Um, And then when that changed its form and became other things, carried on, I think, almost continuously involved in the music business. Um, and is currently in some of things, I think this was a performance as well as music involved, but he's going to tell his story later. And, um, and we'll find out how, what happened after Crass, and so on. So that's the subject of what we're doing tonight. Um, we have the panel, one more big thank you, and then we'll let you we'll applause, and then we'll get started with the questions. Thank you. Right, here's the mic. Good. Too long. There we are. Um, right, you're, you're comfortable up there, are you? Well, I don't know, I'm trying to get comfortable. That's a bit low. That's a bit low. Pull it down a bit. I might sit back up there. And Donnie, you're really comfortable there, I can see yeah, you. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I'm yeah, good. Just I'm going to give it a go. That's better. <laughs> That's better. Right. Back up. Nothing is ever conventional with punk, is it? I think we're in there, because you two out there and me have to sit in. Sit so, yeah. on the back? No, they're not too funny. No, no. It's too low. It's too it won't be funny. Right, right, here's the thing. Anyway. Um, there will be a time for you to tell a bit more detail about what's been happening through those uh, years since 1977. But I'm going to start off with the three short questions for which you might have a, an instant answer. Here's a question for each of you, and I'll give you my answer as well, because I'm supposed to be a punk survivor. Which is, um, when did the word punk, as representing music, as opposed to representing uh, an American kind of colloquialism, when did punk first come to your ears? Do you remember when you first heard about it? I'll tell you where mine was. In 1976, I was in the States, and the States was in thrall to soft rock. The coming band was Kiss, and uh, we knew not what was happening. And uh, somebody while I was in the States said to me, there's this new thing happening in the UK now, it's called punk. And I got back, and I bought the enemy, and I tuned into John Peel, and lo and behold, there it was. This thing called punk. That was my first hearing of it. What about you, Steve? When, when did you first hear about uh, it? I think 1977, when I was in, living in Bristol with my brother, and I was working in the hospital, and I uh, went home one night, and there was an interview on, there was a programme on TV, with an interview with the Sex Pistols. 
and um, it wasn't a Bill Grundy one, it was the Kenneth Street Ball one. And um, she went, well, you know, I can't remember what she said, but she went, so what was it like? I went, oh, you know, we were wonderful, and you know, all this stuff. But he was, looks, he looks so leery and all that sort of thing. Um, and then um, my brother turned around to me and goes, um, what do you think of that? And I went, I think he looks great. I think they're great, you know. And he went, well, if you come home looking like that, I'll tell you to have a bath. And I went, okay. <laughs> um, and I left about sort of six weeks after. Okay, thank you. Claudia, when did you first hear from? I think for me, there was um, an American um, fanzine or magazine and I remember seeing the word punk, I think it might have been called punk. It was, yeah. And I just remember a picture of Debbie Harry um, on the front of it, something like that. So I think it was probably that fanzine magazine where I first came across the word punk. Obviously, it's an Americanism. And um, the Robbie Tree and everything. But that would be the first time that I actually saw the word or, or heard the word, and then it seemed to translate across the pond and um and then it became the word for yeah 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 right, uh, pick up from that when did you first hear the word book? The tunes. Oh yeah. White pants on go. Yeah. And uh, did that signify any music to you or was it just not at the time time because I couldn't stand the tunes. But I, you asked me my first yeah, 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 yeah. association as the Pauline, I think I saw that magazine as well. But I had occasion to have a, 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 a little relationship um, with Patty Smith in '75, and I'm sure that um, she was using that word when I went to see her show and uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, so possibly 1975. Okay. All right. Second question, which is, when do you, when did you first consciously, the three of you, do punk? As in this thing that I've heard about, I'm in it. Right? Steve, when did you first think, you know what, I mean, I'm, I'm doing punk now? Uh, well, it was five minutes after my brother said that thing to me about, you know, get the bath, you know, if you come home looking like that, get off, give you two weeks out of a good bath, and that was it. Right, you were committed from that moment on. Oh, mate, the great intergalactic revolutionary hippie of all time, yeah, fuck you, you know, sorry. It's alright, I'm sure we can manage that. Ah, that was it, mate. If he didn't like it, that was for me. Oh, okay. Well, when did you first think you were going to, when did you first think, well, I'm I think you've got to backtrack a little bit, and um, you know, I was really, I think, you know, a lot of punks are the children of David Bowie, you know, and into Bowie and Roxy, sort of, a few years, years earlier. And I think the people that were into that, which was only a handful of people, I mean, I was brought up in a, a coal mining village, so there wasn't many people interested in um, arty type bands or anything. But um, I remember distinctly. Just before, well, for me, it was seeing the Sex Pistols. But just prior to that, I'd been wanting to see bands like Doctors and Madness, which were like a leftover from the glam rock times. And I actually saw a gig where, where the Pistols just put an end to everything. And punk, it was like created a, a clean page, you know? And round about that time, I, I was. Um, had joined the band with Gary Chaplin and we were doing cover versions of things like The Modern Lovers, New York Dolls, and then um, we saw The Pistols sort of in 76, one of the first Northern gigs that they did, I saw them about six times. I just absolutely loved the attitude, the look, and it wasn't much of a step to being a fan to standing on the stage. It was like, whoa, well, let's just bring up and see if we can get some gigs, and before we knew it, we were out there doing gigs with really early on with not many, there wasn't that many punk bands around um, and um, I would say you know that's the point where we turned our back on everything that went before for instance friends came to see the Doctors of Madness and the Pistols on that gig they didn't get into punk we did it was like you just turned your back on everything a few people from the past managed to get through like Iggy, Lou Reed and, and Bowie but the attitude was absolutely brutal as to what was going forward at this point. So, um, yeah, well, I mean, when I sort of started to sing in a band and that, that's, we were out there championing uh, punk, which was totally new. But you give us a clue then, because actually you were doing punk, rather like Steve, from the moment that you actually identified with the crowd, even before you actually stood on stage and did it. It was, it, you, were, you were 
really. Oh, was it? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, yes. I was in it before I actually stepped onto the stage. Yeah. It was just a small step to take, you know, where you thought, oh, let's have a go, we can do that. Yeah. And that was the great thing about it. Yeah. Don, where are you on this one? Well, first off, I've never called myself a punk in my life. I hope not. But I identified with the spirit and the attitude. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons we're sitting here talking about punk is that it wasn't just a soundtrack. You know, there's this whole school of thought, but not, it's the truth. You know, when the pistols played, when the clash played, you know, the next day, hundreds of bands would spring up, which is true. But also, a lot of people that went to those gigs took away that energy, they took away that attitude, and it informed whatever they did. So you had punk rock photographers, journalists, fashion designers, graphic artists, and filmmakers. And I actually think that's why we're here today still talking about this shit, because it was a complete subculture. As to when I picked up on the vine, very early on, I, like you, I saw the pistols in the Nashville, I saw the Clash play, and what struck me is what they said was, you know, if you're brave enough and you've got a good idea, you can be part of this thing too. I mean, that was one of punk's greatest gifts. They broke, broke down that fourth wall that said, you know, we're the band and you're the fans. We could all be involved, man. Yeah, all right. Um, the third of the chalk questions, because we'll come back to it at the end, is briefly, how do you consider it now? Don, how do you consider punk now looking back 40 years? Do well, I don't spend a lot of time looking back. I've got to be honest, I mean, punk, this whole thing of relegating punk to this weird anom anomaly that happened in the late 70s kind of trivializes a bigger idea. Because mm -hmm. punk did not begin and end in the fucking 70s. Excuse my French. You know, it's not even just about music. It predates, you know, it, it manifests itself in all kinds of artistic mediums that predate the whole music thing. And it's very important that people understand this because if you keep looking back at this thing, it's like a dead thing. Mm -hmm. And punk's a living thing. So, you know, it's something that you're supposed to look forward to, mm. not look back on. Okay. That's not what you asked me, though, is it? No, really, I was saying, no. <laughs> but I do, I'm struggling here with the whole looking back, looking back thing. You've got to take it Well, forward. I don't ask you to look back. I'm asking you to look round now and say, oh, what, what, what is this? What is this? Is in this the West, I'll tell you something. In the West, for me, it feels like punk never happens. I've got to be honest. Because I look around and it's, be, to a large part, it's become, it's very conservative. I don't see that individuality that punk celebrated happening anymore. And um, I think that it actually has informed a lot of things, but not necessarily in music. I think it's very difficult to be radical in music now. They kind of shut you down or keep you out if you've got something to say. But it's informed, you know, cinema. It's informed all kinds of things, man. You know, I think family guys punk rock. Okay. What I don't think it is is people with fast guitars and mohawks. No, 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 no. Uh, what, what do you think? What do you think about it now? How do you consider punk? Um, the fact that we're talking about it four years later means that there was something very powerful went on there. Um, it was anti-establishment for the first six months of it. It really did feel like you were creating <coughs> some new ground. You were kicking against it all. It was despised by most people. It was an outcast uh, movement, and you know now. It's still an outcast movement in the fact that, you know, we still have new Bellion festivals and all that, but, the, the, you know, the, it, it's not just about the music or the fashion. It's about a community of people, and I've met so many people in my life that's, that I've met through all of this, you know, and everything's connected. Um, 40 years later, we're still talking about it, you know, I think it's because it, it emitted something pretty powerful. Um, we're trying to remind ourselves what that was because, like Don says, the state of things now is like even more difficult for anyone to make any sort of move with anything, you know. And um, we weren't, in 1977, we weren't looking back to what went on 40 years before that. Uh, I feel like, you know, it, it lasted a short time. It was just rammed with, you know, creative ideas, clothes, attitudes. Um, but it wasn't meant to last. We, we didn't form a band and think we're going to make it right to the top. We just did it for a laugh. It wasn't really meant to last. And it, I think it burned out fairly quickly because that amount of 
energy, you can't really sustain that. But everything after it was informed by it. Um, as we stand today, it's as if uh, the body was there, uh, the skin was picked, the bones were picked, the dust's there, it's gone. And it's now just something in the ether as far as I'm concerned, and it's really difficult to put your finger on what it is, what it was. Like you can only speak for yourself as an 18-year-old as what it was at the time. And 40 years later, everything I've done in my life's informed by it. My whole way that I live my life, my whole attitude has never really changed. So, you know. Okay, well, I'm going to ask you about that later. I'm going to ask Kevin to all of you about what has informed from that time. But good, Steve. Um, this, this thing about, um, uh, have you got a, a view on it now? This, the punk thing? Yeah, I'm just, yeah. What I, is your view? Well, I'm still doing it. I was down at the pub last night talking to those racist, homophobic, fucking dinosaur dickheads, you know, and they're still trying to put their thing on me, and I ain't having it, so I'm still around with them, still trying to put them right. So it don't stop, you know, the attitude don't stop. You know, I might not play in a punk band, though, but if you call it punk, what cracks did? Well, uh, you know, it don't stop, but I'm still not having it, and that's what the that's what the whole punk thing, you know, uh, did to me. Is like, yeah, you've got a, you've got a voice now. You can use it if you're brave enough. Mm. Stage your case and don't back down and do what they say, you know, back your mouth up, which I do. And at the age of 59, I'm still prepared to roll around the gravel in a car park outside a pub, <laughs> stand up for my butts from the back of the Rather not, but you know. <laughs> Just wish I could sort of make phone calls, you know, get what people do it, but there you go. Yeah. Alright, um, here's, here's a, a slightly big question. Um, mm -hmm. Is it possible to understand punk unless you count in those other musics that were around it? Heavy rock, reggae, disco, folk even. Is it possible to you know, take account of what it is without saying it wasn't? A singular music. It was actually part of a kind of uh, a collection of dynamic. sounds. I know. In other words, you know, has heavy rock, reggae, folk, disco got a part to play in discussing what it was? I'd and say absolutely. Yeah. You know, the problem with all this shit is that when journalists try to kind of define what these things are, it all gets really confusing. I'd say the evolution of rock and roll itself was punk rock. Certainly, invent the invention of reggae was. I mean, you know, that was about turning your problems into assets. The reason it's got a skank is because the guys couldn't do all the Eric Clapton shit, so they turned what would be a problem into an asset and came up with a genre. Hip-hop was, was America's black punk rock. It didn't last long because hip-hop has now become hip-hop. But so the thing keeps turning over, you know. I'd say there was aspects of punk rock to the birth of the hippies. Yeah, 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 I'm absolutely. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Yeah, I'm when it started, it was anti-establishment. You know, you could tick all the boxes, except maybe the style. And even that was anti-establishment. But all these things had an element of this spirit and this rebellion. Because that's ultimately what we're talking about. The minute you pin it down to this 77 moment, as I said earlier, it yeah, trivialises yeah, yeah, a yeah. much bigger idea. Yeah, big. Uh, and like, it's like me, one, like, you know, our Frank's Pete Bright, the bass player, made a crash. God. Frank Zappa for fuck's sake. Anyway, I got a mate called Gilbert, went round his house night, one night and uh, opened a bottle of wine. And after the second one, I mean, come on in, Gilbert, give it to me. Let's have Frank Zappa, so he put on hot racks or something. Bye, bye. Well, the mate, and all of a sudden I was like, oh, this really cool, isn't it? You know? <laughs> yeah, but, and I was like, hey, so am I to pick up on this? It's, it's some, you know, you're right. So if you look back, there's always, it's just of that one four letter word. But, you know, yeah, now yeah, we have yeah. to define it as Don saying at a certain time, a certain place, and it's beyond that. Yeah. I'm in the business of actually getting us to start to take that four letter word apart and throw it away and just look at the thing that matters. And, um, but before I do, or as I'm doing it, Pauline, I mean, heavy rock, for example, I mean, you know, that was the very thing we were supposed to be going beyond when we got to Pauline. But I mean, there was some relevance, wasn't there, in the, in the crossover between the two? Well, everyone has influences and, um, you know, nothing is new under the sun, basically, and um, I think with, um, if, if you compare it to Heaven Walk or something like that, I, I think the punk thing was more polit politicised, it was more overt to yeah. shout and scream about stuff, the, the people playing it were... Um, Quite often, I haven't picked up an instrument before, 
So it was quite primal. Um, it, you know, I mean, I suppose when people started doing folk music and that, they were protesting. Yeah, folk protesting. You know, protesting. Yeah. Um, there's nothing new under the sun, but I think um, punk just had a, in this country, had an effect because we're very much um, a class system in this country. Oh, wow. It, 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 it just, you know, to say God save the Queen and things like that. I don't think you had a heavy metal band saying that. They would say, let's screw the chick. You know, from, from a, woman, a woman's point of view, it, you know, as a woman being in a band, I didn't think I'm a woman in this band. I actually felt like an equal. And I think with punk, there was a lot of tolerance to things like that. It was, everybody was tolerant of each other. Um, he, he felt like the guys was quite protective of you even. <clears throat> the women were out there doing their thing, being spat on. I mean, you didn't get heavy rock bands being spat on. Um, you know, you look at bands now, you think, my God, what would they do if the audience started to spit at them and throw stuff at them? Ed Sheeran being knocked out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It, it was something new that you were forging through. It, it, it was really a lot of energy went out and a lot of energy. There was a lot of anger. So, you know, you can say, you know, like folk music, yes, they did protest and all that, but this was quite vicious. It was quite, quite nasty. Yeah. Well, but if I can just sort of, sorry, Don, if yeah. I can just jump in, you know, and I feel what Paul is saying leads on something else that I think maybe people don't realise about punk, you know, yeah, it was, it was the first time that um, fem, the feminist side of it was taken serious, you know, certainly for me. And, uh, and I remember um, talking to these blokes in a band, they were trying to write non sexist lyrics and failing miserably because, was, you know, because you end up not being able to talk. <coughs> Swallowed spit, sorry. <coughs> But I think the, the punk thing was where the first time when, when the, the women got up and went, well, we're here, you spit on me, I'm going to I'm gonna get lost and I'm crash it between your eyeballs or something. And it was like, I know they take it seriously and people started to take that, that angle of it seriously. Yeah, but also um, the women were actually saying something as well. They absolutely. were just singing along and some lyrics that it got. Yeah, and just and dressed up know, in a little yeah. A lot of the women were... Um, writing their own lyrics about the things that were going on around them. It was really different to what you'd seen women do before. There wasn't really any role models. You just got up and did it, basically. Uh, it was pretty primal, really. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. then it was a learning curve, you know. Yeah. Listen, I'll tell you, I'll tell you on the stage. Um, for some people who were in the crowds, punk was actually about people on stage doing a gig. Actually, for each of you in different ways, it was more than that. I think it was it was the, the, the business. The people on stage were providing a soundtrack to a new school of thought. Okay, but so what was well, right, take the take the seventies through to the eighties. You were making films, you were managing a clothes shop, you were doing a lot of things. It wasn't actually it was a very small sliver of it was actually about the, the being on the stage and in your case not so much till later. I mean what um, what were you up to? What 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 activities did you get up to in that period? I don't understand that goddamn question. <laughs> what activities? Oh, I was a DJ in the Roxy. Yeah, yeah. Um, inspired by the whole punk DIY ethic, which none of us have actually mentioned, which is actually punk rock's yeah. greatest gift. Mm. DIY, do it yourself. You know, my white mates are picking up guitars. I want to get involved. I pick up a Super 8 movie camera and reinvent myself as Don Lex, the filmmaker. And then. You know, but punk's an interesting. Punk was like this ladder that some people got on and got stuck on and got confused by trying to define what it was. And then the intelligent people got on that ladder and just kept climbing. I think there's a lot more harm trying to define what it is than looking at what it could be. And that's what I was interested in. You know, it's like the difference between The Clash's debut album and London Calling. Define. What, me? Yeah. No, that's your job, dude. Right. I just yeah. feel it. I just no, feel I it. I mean, if you ask me to think about these things, you know, these things are in instinctive. Right, the minute you ask me to define something that's instinctive, I, I, I get confused. I think what Don means is that none of us have done these activities before. You picked up a camera, I got up to a microphone and wrote lyrics and sang. But it didn't end there because you actually pushed your own envelope all the time. 
it wasn't really to do with what was going on outside of that. You actually pushed your own envelope. That I think the individuals who were created kept pushing their own envelope. And it's a big learning curve, like you said, from the clashes first of all to, you know, wherever they went. Same as us, we started off with David Clare by the end of it. We were making very accomplished records and we hadn't played before. It was a, pushing your own envelope, improving things, thinking outside the box all the time, just looking. It was, it was a creative process for some people. Basically, some people got just stuck on the fuck you, but after fuck you, it's like, what are you going to do? You know, anybody can do that. Yeah. But it's really about what are you going to do? And it's like oh, all those songs I don't want, but what do you want? Write yeah. a song about what you want. And it's like, oh, well, actually, I don't know. That really separated the kind of first generation. Well, so, yeah, there's so many facets to punk, right? You've got, you know, your, your, your clothes, your music, your graphic design, all of that. But also, you've got the energy, you've got the audience, and you've got the aggression. And so, I think what happened was, the second stage that came along, the aggression, the energy and the aggression is quite a, a basic, primal thing. And I think some people latched onto that side of it, and that's when it started to become more violent. You know, the violent side started to follow through, well, you know, like the... Yeah, confrontation. The tabloid punks you're talking about. Yeah, all you know, the punks that saw the Bill Grundy show. Yeah, it's yeah. hard to punk than you anything know, else. You know, they started to get all the skinhead thing coming up, and all the trouble with gigs and all the fighting, and some people were possibly going for the aggro rather than the musical. I don't know. It meant a lot of different things to us. Right, well, let, let me take one of them. Um, Steve, in that book that you're not too fond of that I was reading before, which has got a quote from you in it, you mentioned something that is effectively an ethical punk. And it was about the idea that behind this thing that we're not wanting to call punk, it's got so many aspects and facets to it. Were a set of values, a set of standards, a set of things you did and a set of things you didn't do, a set of things you stood up for and a set of things you stood up against. And um, I mean, do you, would, you, would you look upon, I don't like the word ethical, but would you look upon, were there, were there such things as punk principles? And I mean, I'm asking like, I was a naive person who just come from Mars, yeah. I know about it. Was back like, and then you were doing all that shit back then? I didn't even know the word principle. Well, yeah, it was in your, if you quote, I quoted you out of a book, so yeah. maybe you didn't actually say it. The fuck? What? I said ethical. <laughs> I was going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't use those words. <laughs> well, I'll show you later. Right, <laughs> okay, all right. Were there, right. were there principles? Were there standards? Um, were there things that you did and didn't do? Were there things you stood up for and stood against? Was there a kind of moral dimension? In your own head. I mean, you know, and as you personally are, what I could never understand was when, you know, to me, punk was like, okay, get get rid of all that bullshit that went before West Ham, Millwall, you know, football, tribalism, and all that sort of shit. Uh, and there's me a few years later playing a punk band, uh, we playing Wigan, and the Wigan punks are waiting for the Preston punks to come down so they can beat the shit out. Yeah. And it's like, well, hang on, I thought this is what punk weren't meant to be about. Yeah. Like, oh no, the fucking Preston punks come down in the fucking right there, like that. Uh, and I was like, hey, what the? Well, that's just the same as what was before. Yeah. So, ethic, ethically, whatever that means, no, that's wrong. So you don't have that. Um, and also, you, you, you don't do the old thing. You don't have the woman as the back. You know, all this stuff. You try, try new stuff. Um, you go to see bands like um, Boys and Girls. I remember some bloke at uh, Boys and Girls did go and say, here, Steve, she's a bit old to be doing this, isn't she? Right, I'm 59. Right, and I mean, yeah, what do you think you're going to do when you're 42? Yeah. And she was singing about the problems of being a single mother and all this sort of thing, you know. And that, was, and that weren't meant to be punk. So yeah, vice versa, you passed away, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but you know, even that was involved in it. So it, it didn't. It peaked up. Did it matter what age you were, what you were? I mean, I know a lot of people, you know, who couldn't afford to look like a punk, so they just looked scruffy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I could never afford a pair of seditions. For example, you know, I never had the proper brothel creepers and that sort of thing. I always had the second hand ones. So, you know, what, what's, what's it matter? It, okay, it, it matter. Did anything matter? I mean, was there anything that you'd say when you, when you broke it down to if there's one thing that we are standing for or with or whatever, is there one thing? I've got to tell you something. The way you're putting it is like it was a committee or a punk commission yeah, 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 or something. Yeah. There weren't nothing like that, dude. We were making yeah. this shit up as we went along. We had no career plan. There was no political plan. Everyone had their own idea of what punk was, which was what made it interesting. The minute you try and bag it and put it into a box, 
then it gets really confusing. There was no party line. Mm. Believe me, the clash were very different to the pistols. You know, all the you know, they're all going to clash with fucking different to everybody. You know, that was the there was no party line. Mm. That's something the journalists are trying to fucking sorry, trying to you know force on it. It was confu It was a confusion. Right, it was a good confusion. Yeah, a creative confusion. It was a creative But that was strength. You yeah. know, every battle was different. You, you know, you hear the slits, you know it's the slits. You know, you hear the other, you know, you eat the generation. Any of the bands, you know, instantly it's them because they were doing their own thing. They weren't all trying to do, fit in with some, um, you know, blueprint. Yeah. Part. It, it was about your own creativity, and that's a wonderful thing to be able to express your creativity. It, that's, that's the most exciting thing about it. Yeah, and, and, the fact, and the fact that when I was, you know, sorry about this, okay. sorry to jump in and all that, but, you know, another thing I would say about punk rock for me, um, what, what it means to me, it, you know, when I was a kid growing up, yes, yeah, someone would be a pop star and that sort of thing, and the closest I got to it was down, you know, Jack Wolfer and Harvey and Dagnum singing on to a playing bubbles, you know. Um, I, how the hell do you buy a guitar? I didn't know how to do it. What, what is a PA? I don't know how you do that. Um, I still don't know how you do that. You know, how do you do that? You know, how do you do it? You know, but all of a sudden, punk rock came along and it's like, yeah, do you know what? If you've got a biscuit tin and a couple of knitting needles, that's your problem with it. Um, you don't have to read music. Oh, don't you? No, no, you just like. And that because it thing. Punk said that a good idea attempted is bad, better than a bad idea perfected. And in the late 70s, there are plenty of bad ideas around. Because you've got to put this thing in kind of a cultural context. You've got to remember that rock by this time was sort of totally removed from the feelings on the street. Do you know what I mean? That's why these guys, I mean, punk rock was actually retaining yeah. the spirit of rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, that was the youth trying to grab this thing back from these overblown, overgrown fucking assholes that didn't know what was going on the ground level. You know, they're talking about Hotel and California. Again, we didn't know where goddamn California was, <laughs> you know. And again, I think that word youth, you know, um, we were 18, 19 year old, and that's a great time to think that you could change the world. And you did think you could change the world. I mean, as naive as that sounds, when you're 18 year old, with the energy, with the ideas, you, you know, all you're doing is going forward, isn't it? You know, and, um, the people that were around prior to that were maybe people from the 60s who were very accomplished in what they did. They were all a bit jaded and, um, Yeah, but they can be relevant. You know, the youth, yeah. the, we are the youth and um, this is our world now and uh, you can... And they needed a soundtrack that was relevant to their situation of the people, for the people, by the people. I think sometimes you've got to discount everything, you've got to just diss everything to get something new coming forward if you're carrying all this baggage. And I think to draw that line and say, right, that's it, you, you can make it through, you you know, you're just back there. It, it, it gave young people the opportunity to write their own uh, page, you know, write their own, about write their own. And about anything, about they want. anything they wanted. So what, about what, what was going on around them, what was relevant to their lives, you yeah, find yeah, it yeah. most punk lyrics yeah. are relevant to their own lives, you know what I mean? What, yeah. what was going on in their world? Soon after that, we started talking about personal politics. We started talking about the fact that everybody had their politics. And I mean, I think, as you said... Politics, even that's kind of overblown. There were like a few, Crass, Joe Strummer, and a few others, but the, the political thing was politics with a very small P. Let's put it that way. Was it? No, not for Crass. It no, that's the, no, well, no, the rest of us, definitely. Let's, let's, the let's hear Steve on the politics yeah. and Crass then. What was the politics of Crown? Well, it's personal. What I felt was that, you know, um, are you an anarchist, Steve? Yeah, I am. Have you read any anarchist books? Yeah, I've tried. I've tried to read them by the Kuna. No pictures, really boring. First page, front back, picked up Saturday night and Sunday morning. Hey, that's my anarchy. That's where my anarchy comes from. It's those 60s films that have got fucking meaning to it. Um, you know, Taste of Honey and all that sort of thing. You know, I'm, if no one's ever seen that film, fucking go and watch it. Because um, that is what my anarchy and punk rock comes from. Read it's it's absolutely, and it's that you know, um, it's it's that injustice um, that I had as a kid. That's it for me, and that was my. But, but the rest of the press, um, who were a lot older than me, and oh yes, well actually we're existentialists. What the fuck is existentialism, Ben? Well, it's rather like the N25, <laughs> and I still don't know what it is. Apparently, that's what we were. Though. We were existentialist anarchists. 
Okay. I was just a spotty little kid looking out for a cheap beer and a bit of a, you know, a bit of a grope in the, you know, backstage area, which we never got, you know. <laughs> a bit of recognition, but I didn't get that because we were all more black and dim light bulbs, yeah, so, yeah. All right, listen, I'm going to, we'll change the pace a minute now. I just want each of you to spend a little bit, rather than short answers, do it. Tell us a little bit of the story of the period when, although it may not have been after punk for you, punk as a, as a kind of media phenomenon had been superseded by a number of things. In the 80s, uh, it fell into the background more, didn't mean it stopped, but media attention paid more attention to new romantics. In some cases, it paid more what attention. Is, well, yeah, it, it yeah. was pushed to the background. Can you just say it when it touched Yeah, well, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, well, let's, all right, let's say, um, Mind you, she started early, she was 79, okay, yes, when she started, all right. Um, uh, all right, uh, live for you through the Thatcher era, and if you want to volunteer to start, I mean, what did, how did you keep going through that period and doing what you wanted to do? Shit, man. Yeah. <laughs> should, should I start? Yeah, probably. From my point of view, you know, um, we started not being able to play, we lived in a tiny little mining village in the northeast of England. We started off doing clubs, we worked our way through the university circuit, we were up to the city hall circuit, we signed the Virgin, had albums out, went to America, and then in 1979 we split up. Um, to me, you know, uh, it lost its fun, I wasn't interested in slowing about being just a fan. It was actually no fun as a life when you're doing it all the time like that. So we split up, and then I did a solo thing in 81, um, which was the Invisible Girls, which was totally different to punk, but it was with Martin Hannah, and it was everything informed by punk that came after it. So yes, everything was informed. But then after that, in 1980, end of 81, I actually walked out of the music business. I just didn't want to deal with it anymore. I didn't like it. I didn't like the... the you had to be arguing all the time to get things to go the way you wanted it. And I just got very burned out and tired. It was a punk was a high energy thing and it really, you know, it, it, I was burned out. So basically, for me, I, I actually came and lived in Liverpool for a year in 1981, um, Princess Avenue. Lived here for a week. The riots broke out from the house. So, yeah, yeah, um, the top set riots, uh, we watched it uh, every night, the helicopters went over, uh, you know, all you got know about this if you're of that age, um, we stayed in Liverpool for a year, it was quite depressing, I was actually doing some recording, got halfway through a song, I said I don't want to do this anymore, so I actually walked out, moved back to Newcastle and got incredibly depressed, like, I've never been depressed in my life, but I went into this very deep depression. I couldn't actually function, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was 23 year old and I felt like I was old. I like, couldn't, but at 23, I thought, that's it, I'm old, I don't want to do this anymore. So I went through a few years totally depressed, but then I thought, well, you can, you've got an ability, you can sing, you can write songs, and I started to write again just for myself, and then started putting stuff out on our own label, uh, did some more solo stuff, and after that, I uh, opened up Rehearsal Studios in, in Newcastle, which we still got uh, 27 years, and had a couple of kids, so it, it's just a life journey, isn't it, you know, um, we all have to deal with wherever we are in our own shoes, at any given time, so that's what happened with me after it all. I just turned my back on it and um, got out of the music business, and I'm not really in it anymore. I just we do stuff for ourselves, we organise stuff for ourselves. We're not really in that game, you know. Well, I mean, you give the audience something to ask questions about, so I'll leave you there because I think yeah. you know there's lots of things that people want to ask about. Steve, what about the 80s for you and onwards? I mean, what was the story of? In quotes, post book for you. <coughs> oh, it was uh, one of the best times of my life. I was sitting indoors looking for the paper, looking for a job, and it was all caps and sets and lathe operators and what the fuck is that? And I wasn't too old for it anyway, so I was already swam. 
Um, and then I thought I'd do a solo album about Jack the Ripper. Thank Christ someone showed me a film called Spinal Tap, because that could have been a piece of my I'm serious. That's not right. So, uh, and then suddenly I started writing, writing a, uh, a, a solo album about Punch and Judy, which never came about, and ended up being a puppet show. Which is what you still do? No, I don't. What? Do you not? No. You don't do the puppet show? No, I don't. But the characters, they, I made them out of um, paper mash and they're too delicate. Punch and Judy? Yeah. You know that about this? Yeah. Well, listen, save it up. All right, you've got that back, right? We'll take that to your, your thing to think about. Questions mm. baked up that way. Don? Punk and Judy. No? Don't the... That was funny. I'm punk and Judy. Punk and Judy, it's not funny. Punk no, I've never heard that before. Punk and Judy, punk and Judy. Sorry, what were you up to? Sorry. Yeah, you, you. Uh, 80s for you onwards. You know, moving on from the... the Dude, first... I can't remember last week. Um, yeah, she can. 80s. No, I can't. Uh, 80s. Help me out here with the Clash broke up. Well, I'll Shit, the Clash broke up in 1982. Big Audio Dynamite! Yeah, go on, tell us the story. Go on. Okay, so um, I'll you. tell you what, you know, all the things that I learned from punk rock, the kind of turning your problems into asset, assets, the whole DIY thing, the whole thing about a good idea attempted, better than a bad idea perfected, all those things still serve me on a day to day basis. And I took that attitude, and I took that spirit, and I ran with it, and I've been running ever since. And the first stop after 1977, was it Big Blue Dynamite and the music videos? Damn. Anyway, yeah, I think I was doing music videos. I did London Calling and Public Image, and I went on to do like 400 music videos. And in tandem with that, joined a band with Mick Jones. And uh, that was interesting. I'll tell you why, because to this day, I still can't play anything. When Mick asked me to join the band, I was like, Mick, I can't play anything. He said, yeah, but remember when Paul joined the Clash? He put stickers on his fret and he learned to play the bass. The difference between Dominic and Paul Simmons is Paul got rid of the stickers. I never got rid of the stickers. I'd be on the stage playing in front of like 3,000 people with loads of stickers on my keyboard. Sometimes I'd be so worked up, I'd pick it up and show the people, like saying, look, if you're brave enough and you've got the balls, you can be doing this shit too. So the 80s, for me, it was Big Audio Dynamite. Big Audio Dynamite. It's something I'm actually very proud of, and I got to work with Mick Jones and write what I think is some very cool songs with the brother. And uh, yeah, that's the eighties. Okay, so they were good for you. They were like, time of your listen, life. man, from punk, from the minute I met these mother, these people, uh, <laughs> life's oh. been great. They gave me the equipment to push things forward and keep going. Okay. You know, seriously, I wouldn't be the man I am today. If I had, if the dread haven't met the punk rockers, simple as that. I own, I own big time. Okay. Well, that's three very different stories from the the next stage on from that. But then, by the same token, here we are, 2017, and you're all still active in something that probably feels like it's got something to do with punk. Steve, what are you up to at the moment? Um, I'm not, uh, not doing a bunch of you. Not doing a bunch of you no more. Um, but uh, no, but I've got my band going and um, it's a little, a little quartet. I'm just playing little places. I'm 50, 40 people, but I like doing it. Um, it's, I've, I've done my big fucking stadium thing, Shepherd's Bush Empire. I don't do it no more. Um, if the last time I seen myself play at Shepherd's Bush, as a 70 year, 15 year old kid walking, I'd never be able to do that. So I thought, no, I'll break it right down. So I'm doing acoustic stuff. Apart from that, I'm still doing stuff with the lifeboat in, in um, Norfolk. Yeah, yeah we need to say a bit more about that because, uh, I mean, you say you're doing something with the lifeboat. You were a lifeboat. What, yes, you, what does that involve? Well, it involves coming out there when everyone else is coming in. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it's very rough. Um, you're sort of shitting yourself and you come out there and um, you don't know what you're going to make. You, know? you pull people out of sea or dogs or whatever it is. Um, no, most people have not been a lifeboatman, so actually this is new to us. Puppets, lifeboats, fuck me out. Don, just this man is... This man is and then say, he's done. I, I, I live in Norfolk now, and my missus goes, let's move to Norfolk. I went, yes, let's move to Norfolk, and I can just like, stop everything, I'll leave the music industry, all I'll do is sweep leaves, and I'll write books, end up doing a fucking gig at the Shepherd's Bush Empire, then I end up being a fucking lifeboatman, because I gave him a cheque for, you know, a load of money, I'll come and sit with me down, and I'll yeah, write like, something more sorted. So, um, yeah, that's how I'm not doing that. Yeah, so, okay. So, you know, um, and that's one of the, um, you know, you saying, you know, big audience, you know, I'm really proud of what I've done with that. And I'm, you know, it's not a big thing. Um, I, well, you're too old now, you lot. 
it's a young person, sure, but you know, <laughs> and you don't need to the coast, but you know, if any you get a chance to get involved in it, do it, because you won't need drugs or alcohol or anything like that. That's the biggest adrenaline much you'll ever get, that feeling when you've made a difference to someone's life. You know, so. okay. uh, not only for the punk thing, so I think we all did that as well. Yeah, yeah. No, I think punk rock did that as well. You know, punk rock made different people's lives. And so do the fire brigade and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, respect. Yeah. All right. Paulie, yeah. you, you, you are, in fact, I know you're going to be back in Liverpool at least twice more this year. Yeah. So you're, you're really back with the music industry, aren't you? Not with the music industry, but with music. Go on, um, tell us more then. Well, I'd, I'd set up Universal Studios in 1990 and um, set up my own business, basically, took a risk with that and had two young children. And in 2001, I met the ex guitarist and the drummer both got in touch with me the same week about reforming the band, and I'd always said, No, I won't do it. Simply because I thought, That's in the past, I don't think I could even sing those songs now. You know, I'm going to be 40 odd year old. Anyway, we gave it a try, and um, we eventually, they were part of it, but we got a set together and um, we had a set, so we said, Well, let's all do a few shows, and we did that. So we've been doing that since, but it fits with us these days. We don't fit with it. Too. We decide when we want to do stuff and, and what have you. We did an album a couple of years ago, which was terrifying to do a new album. After all that time, how can this be relevant when you're always compared to the past, you know? It's difficult to make moves in the present because of all this looking back business. It's, you know, difficult. Anyway, we did an album. It was very well received. But then about maybe four years ago I started and I was asked by someone to do um, an acoustic link with Viv Albertine and Gina Birch who's in Gateshead and I said to the guy I'd never done that in my life and before I knew it my name was on the poster so I thought I've got to get the shit together here. So I learned like three songs. I mean I didn't have an acoustic guitar when I was about 14 out of the grand catalogue, you know, or something like that. I hadn't really picked it up. Oh, I better get this sorted and I was totally it was terrifying to get there and do it on your own. But I eventually wrote more songs around that and I eventually did a few more shows which was terrifying. I ended up going to Australia for two weeks doing it. I don't know how that happened, but this guy was really persistent. So I've actually started to do acoustic things, right? And um, I'm pretty much of a novice. I mean, uh, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're terrible. Um, but I did a few with the mission last year because we met Wayne Hussey. Um, he was part of the Invisible Girls in 1981. He lived in Liverpool when we put an advert in Melody Maker and Wayne answered it. He was a, a straight laced uh, Mormon and didn't smoke, didn't drink. And um, he came to Europe with us and uh, he was in Liverpool, which is one of the reasons we came here. Anyway, my soul stuck when the mission formed in the mid 80s, um, we supported them and now they're back out there. I mean, every band's back out there, really. Um, and um, last year, they said we'll just do a couple of acoustic openings for half an hour each year. I did that, and then I'm doing like six coming up. Uh, I'm coming back to uh, Liverpool next, next week to do one. So I do the acoustic thing. Um, which is the opposite of penetration, it's just so quiet, it, it, it's really intimate and it makes you feel like you're alive because if there's only you there, if you cock it up, it's like, oh shit. You're right, there's no way to go. Yeah, yeah, you know, but you do, it does make you feel like you're alive, which is, you know, a brilliant thing. So I do that and then um, we've got gigs coming up with penetration again in October, but we sort it all out ourselves, we don't know whether it will be ongoing, whether it won't be, we're actually writing towards another album, just trying to keep creative really, you know, in one way or another. So what, what's, the, what's your current preoccupation, apart from your yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, what am I doing now? You know what I'm doing? I'm hustling. Well, it's a slightly glamorous hustle, but like many of you all, I'm sure I'm juggling all these different things to survive. I live in London, by the way. That might explain why I DJ nationally and internationally, I'm still making films, and I have a show on BBC Six Music, a mm -hmm. uh, weekly show, and uh, basically what I've always done, juggling music and film. And 
I get to make a living doing something I enjoy. So I count myself a winner, not a punk rock survivor, but a goddamn punk rock success. A hard worker is not a hard worker. I think a lot of punks were hard, you know, there's a work ethic sort of involved, thank you. Oh, ethic. Ethics. <laughs> yeah, but we're big now, we can use those words. Trust me, it's definitely work ethic. It's just used the word work ethic. You had the work ethic. Work. <laughs> <laughs> right, stop there, stop there, right. Audience.